start by thanking the organizers for having me here. It's an honor to be in this group of speakers. Um, and I will tell you about uh, my research. So we'll continue and talk about proteins. And there they are. And I also had some little things. No, I also had some snakes. My snakes, my toys. Good. OK. So perfect. So I am in Sweden, at, in Gothenburg. And my name is Penilla Wittung Stavsele. And you said it really well. So if we think again about living organisms, human beings, animals, all kinds of organisms, they built up by a number of cells, different kinds of cells that hold the organism together. And we have millions and millions of cells. And in each cell and between each cell, there are proteins. And these proteins are the machines of life, you can say. They do all the work. And this is, and we have a lot of protein. In a human being, it's about 15 kilo. So we have many proteins because each of them are very small. So this is my research area. How does these proteins work? What do they do and how do they do that? And how do they look like that? So I just want to um, explain again my background. So I got my PhD in 1996 in Sweden at Chalmers University. I moved to America for my postdoc. I did that at Caltech in Los Angeles, and I spent two years there. Then I got a position as a professor in New Orleans at Tulane University. And I was there for five years. And then I moved to Texas, to Rice University in Houston. And then after five years, I decided to move to Sweden back. So then I moved to the very north of Sweden, a city called Umeå. And there I was a professor at Umeå University in chemistry for seven years. But then I was recruited back, kind of closing uh, the circle, to coming back to Gothenburg. And since a year back, I've been a professor at Chalmers University, where I also did my undergraduate degree then. So proteins. You heard already in the previous talk about some really important proteins that are involved in the ribosome and some of this introduction too. But let's go through it again. What are proteins? Well, we all know that food that we eat contain proteins. So we need to eat food to get protein. And a lot of food contains proteins. But in the body, these proteins are broken down to the building pieces, the building blocks, the amino acids. And then the amino acids are taken up in the cells uh, or in the body. And then when we go into each cell, new proteins are made from the building blocks. So it doesn't matter what proteins we eat, actually, uh, as long as we get the building blocks. And then these new proteins, we get thousands of different proteins. They perform all the chemical, physical, and mechanical work in living organisms to really create life. So as we heard, DNA defines proteins. That's a central dogma. So the genetic information in DNA, the genes, um, are read into pieces of RNA that's then translated to a polypeptide chain. And this is what Ada talked about, uh, the ribosome putting the pieces together to this long polypeptide chain or protein chain. But then these long chains, so here's where my toys come in. So I can mimic a polypeptide chain like this. This is a protein chain. It's a linear chain of amino acids. In order to function, it needs to curl up to a unique three-dimensional structure. So that's called folding. And that's important to get the active protein because structure determines what chemistry is on the surface and that dictates what function a protein has. And if folding goes wrong, we can have problems with folding because we get the wrong, I mean, we have a mutation in DNA, so we get the wrong amino acid at a certain position in this chain, and then maybe it cannot fold anymore. Or there could be external perturbations that mess up proteins, such as, um, stress and aging and chemicals. So they, this can go wrong and then it can lead to degradation or aggregation of the protein and we lose the function. And that's not good. So proteins are actually amazing molecules because they fold to their folded structure spontaneously. Proteins fold in us now when we're sitting here all the time. So if we go from this unfolded state, sometimes I mimic this with a boiled spaghetti um, it's a long floppy chain. It has to fold up to this kind of more yarn ball. That's uh, a unique, more uh, ordered structure. Uh, 
and all the information for how to fold, what final structure to reach, is encoded in this boiled spaghetti. It, the linear chain knows what structure to fold into. If we open this up again, it always comes back to the same structure. So somehow the information is in here in this boiled spaghetti. So we want to understand how this works. And in order to do that, we can study these reactions and try to no learn more about speed, mechanism, energetics of how proteins go from this state to that state. And we know that if a protein folding is fast, it occurs on biological timescales, less than a second for most proteins. But if this was a just a random process, uh, uh, there's a lot of degrees of freedom and conformational space to test in, at each amino acid. It would take forever to test all kinds of random conformations and eventually find the right one. So there must be pathways or guiding factors that direct the protein to the right structure. And that's what we want to find out what the driving forces are for folding and how this happens mechanistically. But before I go into how this might happen, I want to tell you why this is important to study. So it is important because it's a fundamental process in nature. Nature knows, like the ribosome, nature knows how to do this really fast. Um, so we want to understand that. And if we understand protein folding, we can predict protein structures and their function then from DNA sequences. There's a lot of genomes today that have been sequenced, so we have a lot of DNA information out there. We can sequence the genome of humans, but we don't really know how to make sense of all of that information because we don't know how to go from a linear chain of amino acids to a folded protein and therefore what function it has. It's also important because then we can design new proteins. If we know the, the, the rules of protein folding, we can say we want a protein with this structure and this, therefore this function. We can design whatever functionalities we want. And that could be very important in biotechnology and in medicine. Then we can also increase the production yield of proteins that are made for some pharmaceutical uses. For example, insulin is a protein that's also used as a drug if you have diabetes. But it's very hard to make proteins in very large scales. So it would be good to be able to help the proteins, reach, change them a little bit so they fold better. Then we can make cheaper medicine. And also, finally, to understand better and eventually stop diseases that are caused by proteins that don't fold correctly, that misfold and somehow lead to disease. And I come back to that on my next slide. But before, I just want to say that this topic is basic science, understanding molecular mechanisms of, of uh, natural processes, but it's also applied research because we see the applications in life science, and there are many. So if folding goes wrong, this can lead to loss of function. If the protein is not made properly, you, you lose that function. Uh, and that can hap many times happens in cancer. Then we have a protein called P53. It's a tumor suppressor, so it blocks cancer cells from dividing. But if you have mutations in P53, the protein cannot fold. And therefore, it cannot function and suppress uh, that cells divide. So instead, cancer cells can divide uh, and develop. But we also have what we call more gain-of-function diseases or misfolding diseases, where you add on new bad functions that cause problems. And in the misfolding diseases, you have proteins that aggregate into amyloid fibers. And amyloid fibers, it's kind of that picture there, it's, it's long fibers that contain ordered uh, polypeptides. So that's why I have many of these. So somehow the proteins misfold and then they attach on top of each other to form these really long fibers. This is the basis of Alzheimer's, Huntington's, Parkinson's disease, type 2 diabetes, and prion diseases, and more diseases as well. And this is a growing problem because one risk factor is age. Everything goes a little bit more bad when you get older. So the older the population gets, the more of these problems we will have. So it's important to understand and figure out ways to cure this. So somehow in these diseases, polypeptides or protein chains assemble into these really long structures. And something on this, in this process, going from this aggregation path to these long fibers, is toxic. But we don't really know yet what is the toxic species. So in Parkinson's, which I'll come back to in the end of this talk, this, the protein is called alpha-synuclein. 
It's a strange name, but that's the name of the protein. It forms these amyloids in brain cells, and that is toxic and result in neurodegeneration and cell death and consequences of that. So understanding how proteins fold correctly is the first step to understand why it goes wrong in these diseases. So how does it work then? Well, what defines how proteins fold? So since I started my postdoc kind of 20 years ago, um, there's been many folding studies in test tubes in dilute solutions. So we've learned a lot about individual proteins, how a chain like this, how it folds, what, how, what the speed is, and so on. So we know mechanisms and speeds and, and all, a lot of parameters for, for individual proteins. And in fact, when I was doing my postdoc, I got the world record in fastest folding protein. Because at that time, it was really interesting to find out how fast can it go. And, and in fact, it is diffusion or forming a loop, bending over, that's the slowest step. Then you can kind of do small wiggles much faster. So we know a lot of things, but if we think about most proteins that we have in our bodies or in different organisms, they are more complicated than one single polypeptide. That's why I have many of these. So we also need to consider protein-protein interactions when we have oligomeric proteins. So oligomeric means that we have a dimer or a trimer. If we think about the ribosome that you heard a whole talk about, it has many different polypeptide chains and also uh, RNA together into one functional unit. So we can have a dimer that has two chains and have to sit together to be active. Um, here the proteins have to find each other. So the question is, do they, do they fold first individually and then find each other? Or do they actually meet in this unfolded state and that triggers folding? So they fold together. That's one question. We also have binding on metals to take into account when we have metal binding proteins. So many of our proteins binds metals. So here's a little red metal. So then we have to think about do the protein fold first and then the metal binds? Or do the protein actually bind the metal first and that triggers folding? Maybe these interactions with the metal or another protein is those driving forces for folding. If that's true, we need to look into that in order to understand how proteins fold. So this became my research topic when I started my own lab and that we studied many different proteins to try to understand how these different additional kind of complexities affect protein folding reactions. So I want to have a slide and point out that metals are important. So we need metal ions for life. Most of life is organic, but we also need some metals. So transition metals like iron, copper, zinc, and manganese are very important in small amount. And that's because they have unique chemical and physical properties. They're very reactive. So by putting them in a protein, you add functionality. So in fact, 30 to 40% of all the proteins we have in human body bind a metal. So if metal plays a role in folding, it's kind of a large group of our proteins that ha have that feature. And in fact, half of all enzymes, which are the proteins that do reaction and catalyze reactions, they bind metals. But also, on the other side of the coin, metals are toxic in free form, so we have to have them in a very controlled way in our body. Otherwise, they can result in many problems, neurological cancer, overload diseases, or anemia, uh, iron anemia, for example, you know about that. And, but it can cause a lot of trouble if we have too much or too little of metal ions, or the wrong metal ions in our body. So one example, and this was brought up in, in Ada's talk as well, uh, she mentioned blood and that we have this transport protein called hemoglobin. So hemoglobin is red, or blood is red, and it's because hemoglobin is red, and it's red because it binds iron. And it, hemoglobin has four iron groups, and it also contains four of these polypeptides. So it's an example of both an oligomeric protein and a metal binding protein. And it's a very common protein that we all know. And there are many more examples of important metal binding proteins and oligomeric proteins. So we've studied many different protein systems 
and we found that protein-protein binding interactions can precede folding um, for proteins that have more than one chain. And we also seen that methyl binding before the folding can actually trigger the folding. So if we want to understand folding in biology, we need to take these additional factors into account to really understand what goes on. But many times we want to understand how proteins fold in real life, in living organisms, inside a cell. And then cells are very complicated. It's highly crowded inside a cell. Uh, there are many, many biomolecules. So what you see here is kind of a computer simulation of the inside of a cell. And each of these blobs is a little protein. So this is kind of how crowded it is. You can see the proteins are packed next to each other and they're all kinds of proteins. As I said, we have thousands of different proteins. And in fact, these proteins should wiggle as well because everything is dynamic, so it's not just a static structure. So that kind of means that this test tube with the dilute solution of one single protein that we used for many years to study is not the right environment if we want to mimic the in vivo condition. So if we think about this in vivo scenario, maybe that can affect how proteins fold. So we started to look into that. So the current questions or the qu uh, we are asking in the lab is really how does protein fold and bind and do their function in vivo, in this type of complicated jam scenario. So here we have to think about, one thing is to think about how metals are delivered to the right protein. As I said, metals are toxic in the free form. So therefore, in the human body, we don't have any free metals. Uh, instead, there's proteins, particular proteins that are dedicated transport proteins that move the metal to the right protein that should use it for function. How does that work? And also, in this messy uh, um, type of environment, maybe there could be a lot of unwanted interactions between different proteins that are not supposed to meet each other. And that can maybe cause disease. Can we learn something about that? So how do we do this? Before I tell you some results and some things we've looked into and found out, I want to tell you a little bit how we study things in the lab. So we make proteins, and for that we use bacteria. What we can do is that we can put pieces of DNA into the bacteria, and then we let the bacteria make our protein, following the central dogma. Then we can... After growing these uh, bacteria, we can purify or break up those bacteria and just take out our proteins using different purification steps. And in this way, we can study in principle any protein we want. Um, and we can go in and change the DNA, a little amino acid, because we change the DNA code for a particular amino acid, and we make, can make a different protein that has another amino acid here, and we can learn the molecular role of that uh, amino acid, for example. That might be a metal binding site or something that we think is important. So this way we have studied many different systems. Then we do experiments in test tubes in the lab. Or we can do equilibrium experiments to see how, things, how stable things are, what the shape of the protein is, how strong does a metal bind, so we can ask those type of questions. We can do kinetic experiments, so we look at the time-resolved reaction. Then we can look how fast is folding or aggregation if we look at am amyloids. What is the rate determining step? Or maybe we can see transient intermediates that are important for the mechanism. And we, can also, um, we also need to have ways to unfold the protein because when we make proteins in bacteria, we make the protein we want to study, but then it's already folded. So in order to study folding, we need to first unfold it so we can refold it and study that reaction. Then we can use different ways in the lab to unfold proteins. If we heat them up, the proteins unfold. If you think about boiling an egg, for example, that has a lot of protein in it, the, pro the proteins in egg unfold, and that's why the boiled egg gets hard. Uh, we can change pH or chemical denaturants. So there are ways to, to, to play with this. We can mimic the in vivo environment. We can try to jam it up so we have a lot of proteins. We can change salt and pH in different conditions so it looks more like inside the cell, but still in a test tube so we can do experiments. But then how do we see what happens? So proteins are very, very small, so we don't see one protein at a time. We have them in a water-based solution. 
So we need to use methods to indirectly see the proteins and what they're doing and how they look like. So here spectroscopy is an important method, or many methods actually, that use light to look at molecules. And we also have other methods, biochemical tools and calorimetry uh, that measures heat. So we combine a number of different methods. In principle, it's putting a puzzle together uh, to understand, to look at different pieces and then put them together to the big picture. So I just want to point out spectroscopy because it's very important. And this is then you shine light on your sample and you look how much light is absorbed by the sample by looking how much light comes out on the other side. If you lose some light, you know that was absorbed. So then you can look at that because proteins absorb light and metals absorb visible light. That's why they have a color. You can also twist the light. For example, you can make it circularly polarized. It's almost like sunglasses, but in a circle you polarize the light. Then you can understand something about the asymmetry of the proteins, and that will be different if it's folded or if it's unfolded. And also we can look at something called fluorescence, where we take advantage of the amino, some amino acids in proteins can send out light. So then we can send light onto a sample and we see how much light comes out in 90 degrees angle. Because that's light that comes from the protein. So then we can learn, if we look at that light, we can learn something about how, how those amino acids that sent out the light, how they are positioned in the protein. So really what we're doing today in the lab is we're going from protein folding to protein folding in a more cell-like environment to metal delivery by metal transport proteins. And also we're starting to look at directly protein misfolding into amyloid diseases um, to really try to see if we can figure out ways to stop those diseases. But in the end, we, we try to probe mechanistic principles of proteins using a range of biophysical methods. So we use kind of chemistry to understand biological problems. So now the last minutes I have, I will tell you a little bit about discoveries that we have made. So you kind of understand what type of things we can find out. So one thing that we started to look at was this crowded cell environment. And simple theory that people had um, derived was that this unfolded chain, if it's very jammed with proteins around it, there will be it will be kind of compressed or compacted in this crowded environment because it will bump into things. So that's kind of what, what was predicted. But what we found that was uh, surprising was that the folded protein could also change structure. So if you already have the folded unique structure, it's not a unique structure anymore, it changes a little bit. So we could see that this one protein that I show you here is elongated, so when the conditions became more and more cell-like, you first bent the protein and then you collapse to a sphere that occupies less space than this long molecule. So this protein happened to be a Lyme disease protein and there is a, a place in this protein that we, when we have Lyme disease, we make antibodies and we can use those antibodies to say that you have Lyme disease, but the antibody binds to this green part here in the protein and it was always puzzling to scientists, why do we make an antibody to something that's hidden within the protein? But then if you look at the more structure that, that we think it's the structure in a cell-like environment, this green part pops out on the, on the surface. So if this is what's actually floating around in a natural environment in a host, it makes sense to make an antibody to that part of the protein. So we think that the cell environment, at least in some cases, can tune the protein shape and therefore the protein activity and maybe make it more effective or less effective. We also looked at metal transport proteins and here we focused on transport of copper ions. So copper is an essential metal. It's involved, for example, in respiration, in many different enzymes in our body. But free copper is very toxic. So there are the dedicated delivery systems. So we have a protein that takes copper into the cell. Then we have another protein, and I'll say the name is called ATOX1. It moves the copper in the cytoplasm to another protein that's sitting in the Golgi. That's a big ATPase protein that moves the metal into the Golgi and then 
there are proteins come by that need a metal. So it gets a copper. So this is the transport system to move copper from the outside to needing proteins in here. But then we stumbled on cancer drugs here because it turns out there's this cancer drug called cisplatin. So it's a metal complex. It's an important drug that kills cancer, but it also has a lot of side effects and you develop drug resistance to this drug. And it was, people have asked, why is that? And then we found that this drug, cisplatin, can bind to this little protein, Atox1, in the cytoplasm. And in fact, it cannot just bind. It can bind together with the copper ion so they could share the binding site, so they can bind together. And when this is done, we found that the protein unfolds uh, because of this uh, drug binding. So we think that that can explain why you get so much resistance and side effects, that the drug comes into the cell and binds this protein and stops there. So it cannot go into the nucleus and kill the DNA, which is the point of cisplatin. In fact, we are looking now into new functions for these copper transport proteins. It turns out that they, in addition to moving the metal to the right partner, they seem to do more things. And one of those things is cancer. So we looked, uh, and kind of the key here is that we found this atox protein that I said was in the cytoplasm. It was also now found sometimes in the nucleus of cells. So it's in the wrong compartment compared to what we know. And why is it there? So the, here we use uh, systems biology, which is you can use large data sets that are available. And we looked at how much of different copper binding proteins are expressed in cancer cells versus normal cells. And I'm not going to explain this whole pattern, but what we can see here, if we have cup, different copper proteins here and different cancers here, so sometimes it's red, that means it's more of that protein in cancer. And sometimes it's blue, it means it's less of that protein in cancer. So it's hard to make sense of this, but you can, you can see that there would be new pathways here to look into that some proteins are very, there's more of those proteins in cancer, so maybe they play a role. And it's known that copper is important in cancer somehow because tumors have a lot of copper in them. But we don't know what proteins and why. So we think that by taking these kind of uh, uh, information from data analysis, we can go in and do molecular experiments to understand how these proteins play new roles. And just one thing I want to point out, we took the protein Atox, the chaperone, uh, or the protein in the cytoplasm in breast cancer, and we looked at its localization in this cancer cell, and we could see that it was on the edge of the cell, which is not where it should be if it's just transporting copper. So we think it might play a role maybe in metastasis and migration of the cells. So that's something we're going to look into now. But the last two, three minutes, what I have, I want to uh, talk about misfolding and amyloid diseases. So this is very important. So we want to understand how these unfolded proteins or polypeptide chains assemble into these long amyloid fibers. It's a complex process because you go from something very small to something larger, maybe thousandfold larger. So you have assembly of monomers to something that's called oligomers and then more assembly and eventually you get these very long fibers. So it's very heterogeneous, it's many different species, it could be off-pathway things that are dead-end things. So it's not as simple as protein folding, where you just have folding, unfolding, and folding. And we want to understand how it starts, what the intermediate structures are, and really what is dangerous, because this causes disease. So we want to learn how to modulate, stop, and reverse. And for this, we need to have mechanistic molecular information, so we really understand what goes on. So we started out looking at small molecules at, as tools. So we played around with little molecules like this, and we could see, for example, that this molecule he here, it called FNO75, it could speed up. Because here we use fluorescence and we can, as a function of time, and if you have a high signal, you get amyloids. So then we could see by adding this molecule, it goes much faster. It takes six hours instead of 24 hours. So you have a molecule that speeds up, and then we can modify the molecules to get a whole toolbox of molecules that could slow down or stop or do nothing and speed up more or less. 
And then we can use these molecules to study the reaction better because we can see different steps on the way by stopping at different time points. So using these type of molecules, we found that the mechanism of aggregation goes through these little balls here. We call them oligomers. And they're spherical things, but depending on their internal structure, we could figure out which ones would go on and become fibers and which ones would stop and not do anything more. But you could all ask here, if we have molecules that actually can speed up aggregation, can that be given to an animal or, or a living organism and that would actually trigger disease? So we thought that was a question to test. So we took this molecule that speeds up aggregation because that would say that this aggregation process is truly the cause of disease. And we gave this molecule to mice in their brain and we waited six months and we could see many of these parameters that says that these mice get Parkinson's disease. There are cells that die in their brain at the place where you get Parkinson's brain cells die. They have motor dysfunction. I don't know if you can see, they have a blue sticker on their nose. And that's a motor test. You take the time it takes for the mice to remove that sticker. And they were slower for these mice that got this molecule. And also we could look at their blood, their metabolites, and see that it matched newly diagnosed patients. So all these signs pointed to that these mice get early stages of Parkinson. And there was no effect of inhibitory molecules, but so the point is that why do we want to give mice Parkinson? It, it, it's not so, so weird because we really need new tools to study the early events of disease because there's no good models for these diseases. And many times they are at the late stages. So the cells are already dead, but we need to look at the earlier stages so we can cure it before it goes bad. We also looked at the role of bacterial proteins and we found that they can affect the human Parkinson's protein. Here we, we looked at some, some uh, proteins that are found in bacteria that we have in our gut and they temper or affect amyloid formation in bacteria because amyloids can also, uh, bacteria can also make amyloids when they make biofilms and they adhere to surfaces or inside us. So one protein could um, inhibit and one could accelerate amyloid formation, uh, we found. But the, we could also look into the mechanism how this happened and we could figure out that they use the same binding site but the, the outcomes were different. So that's important to try to figure out the details how this happens. And we could see that the one that stopped it made tiny little ligamers, so you still assemble a little bit, but you don't go all the way to these longer fibers. And why do we do this? Well, we have a lot of bacteria in our gut. Mostly the, these are good bacteria, as you heard about, but some could be bad. And nonetheless, there will be bacterial proteins floating around in us. Um, so they can meet human proteins. So it's, a, it's important to know if they can actually tell each other to do something. So maybe bacteria or proteins from bacteria can trigger amyloid diseases or they can stop them. I mean, there's many, many proteins in those two kilos of bacteria. But the new thing here is maybe it could be protein-protein interactions. It's not the bacterial infection per se, but it's the proteins that escape and do the job. Finally, I want to mention a link to type 2 diabetes. So it turns out that type 2 diabetes patients, they have increased risk of getting Parkinson's, but we don't know why. So then it's an important, in, when you have diabetes, well, there's a protein called IDE that's important to degrade insulin and regulate blood sugar. And if that does not function, you get diabetes. But what was found was that also when you get, when this protein doesn't function, you get more of the Parkinson's protein. Uh, you increase your synuclein levels. So we thought that that means that these proteins are co correlated somehow or inversely correlated. So maybe they interact with each other or bind each other. So we made this protein IDE and we wanted to see if it could affect the aggregation reaction of the synuclein protein or the Parkinson's protein. And indeed, we found that it was a very good inhibitor. So when we add this IDE protein to the Parkinson's protein, you can block amyloid formation. At the same time, you have this dual functionality. The IDE protein became better at its own job. So both of them win on this. 
So in diabetes, we think that the alpha-synuclein protein is more prone to aggregate because there's no IDE there that can stop it from aggregating. So that could explain why you are more prone to get a second disease. So with that, I'm going to skip this slide because I know I'm late. So I want to point out, ending here now, that research is teamwork. And early on, I did experiments myself. But now I have students in my group that do the experiments. So these are students that have worked in my lab over the years. And I would say that they are the true heroes. They do all the experiments and make all the discoveries. So these are undergraduates and graduate students and postdoctoral students. So these are ones that have been in my lab. And now I have a uh, group in Gothenburg in Sweden. And so these are my current discovery makers, as I call them. So this is my group. And with that, I would like to end. And thank you very much for listening. OK, questions from students? Again, clearly, okay. short. <laughs> Go ahead. OK, um, nice to meet you. Uh, I'd like to ask, what is the most um, stable form of protein, if that kind of thing exists? The most stable form of proteins. Well, yeah. the, it depends on the conditions. Mm -hmm. But I mean, it, the folded form is more stable than the unfolded form. Yeah. That's why it spontaneously folds to the folded compact form. Mm -hmm. But then if you change the temperature and you heat it up, the unfolded form is more stable. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of, it, depend, it has to depend on the conditions, but you, most of the time you are at the most stable state, that's what you have. So folded are more stable than unfolded. That's probably the answer. Thank you. And I really enjoy your lecture as I'm interested in um, researching neurological diseases. So my question is, um, is there a way to identify proteins that will mishold to cause those neurological diseases before they mishold or before they cause the diseases? I th that's the question that we want to answer. Or many people try to figure out what's the first step of, of misfolding or the problems that lead to neurological diseases. Because many times, like, like many diseases and cancer and tumors, you see it in the end when it's already really bad because you have these uh, amyloids or, or tumors that's there. But you want to see the first steps. Yeah. People are trying to maybe look at metabolites in blood so you can take a blood sample and see if you're prone to something or if something has started or if you can do some other test. But th we don't know that yet. And, and Neu neurological diseases arise over many, many years. It's a very slow process. Mm. So if we could see it 10 years in advance, that would be really good. But, and that's what we want to try to figure out. Okay. But that's, I think, why we need models, too, to be able to look at the first stages. If we have a model that we know is going to go into disease, we can see what happens in the beginning and see if that can be used in terms of diagnostics. Okay. But that's, you know, we, we need more people, young people, to work on this. Yep. Thank you. Thank you for your um, very intriguing presentation. Um, my question is rather basic. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned how you have the world record for um, fastest folding of the pro yeah. protein. And I was um, v very curious as to how exactly um, you can artificially fold a protein, or the specific process that goes behind that. That's good. I didn't explain that because that comes into the kinetic experiments that we do. So most often you can, you can, you can have a, use spectroscopy to see what happens, but then you need to have a mixer so you can mix two things quickly. Mm -hmm. So then you can mix an unfolded protein, say with a solution that favors folding. So when they are mixed, the protein wants to fold. So then you start a reaction. And then if you can monitor a signal as a function of time, you will follow folding. So a lot of mixers that we have in the lab, they have a dead time. It takes a millisecond to mix the two things. Mm -hmm. So then you can only look at reactions that are on that time scale or slower. But my world record in f protein folding was about one microsecond. So it's 
you know, much faster. So then we used a different method. Then we used lasers. And then we used particular proteins. Actually, it's an interesting story because it, that's how I got interested in metalloproteins or metal binding proteins. Because I'm not going to explain the whole thing, but you can use the oxidized or reduced form of a metal bound to a protein. And then you can use a laser to change that redox state. And that can sometimes trigger folding. So then you can trigger folding on less than microseconds. And then you can measure something that happens on microseconds. Thank you. Uh, I have a question. Uh, you used a small uh, molecule as tool. Uh, how did you find it? Is it familiar? Uh, how, how I found the small molecules? Uh, I found them in the corridor in my lab. No. Uh, the thing was, I, I, I moved to UMU University. I got a new collaborator that was an organic chemist. He worked on these small molecules, but he wanted to use them as new antibiotics. Mm -hmm. And he was adding them to bacteria, but then he was affecting bacterial amyloids. So we thought that if they can affect the same type of structural fo protein uh, conformations, maybe we can test them on human proteins. So then it became interesting to see if they worked on humans. And then this molecule I showed is a very good inhibitor of bacteria. It's kind of a new antibiotics. But then we found it can give Parkinson's. So it actually ta talks about the importance of looking at cross-reactivity. Because you don't want to kill the bacteria and at the same time get Parkinson's. That's not a good idea. Uh. So it, it, it was hit. this other group's you know, favorite molecule that he's using for a lot of drug studies uh, that okay. we took advantage uh. of. Yeah. OK, thank you. Mm -hmm. I have one question. Um, in your lecture, it was said that as the study of proteins are proceeded, we may be able to find new types of proteins that can perform certain functions or properties. Mm -hmm. uh, would it be possible to find some proteins that can perform properties or functions that are actually organic, not only medicines that are inorganic? So the question is if we can make proteins that act like small molecules or, or current drugs today? Yes, like actual living organisms that can perform as they live, not like inorganic medicines that can uh, perform in making diseases uh -huh, go well. uh, oh, so you mean, oh, so you mean to use proteins to see if you, they, in, in a living organism, can kind of just come in and... Yeah. I think that that's possible. I think there's many hurdles on the way. But I think that's where, where some people want to go with this, that if we know how to design proteins that do certain things, you know, then you have to think about how to send it into a living organism so it survives there and comes to the right place and do its job. But that can be overcome. So I think that that's eventually that's a, that's a possibility. Thank you. In your speech, you mentioned about how the role of metal ions in proteins. Mm -hmm. But my, um, I was under the impression that, for example, sodium and potassium ions are free in a cell to regulate osmosis. So my question is, are all metals toxic free in the cell and why? That's a very good question. Uh, I didn't say that, but you're exactly right. Sodium and potassium are free in the cells, and they are not toxic. They are there to regulate things, and they go in and out of the cells. But the transition metals, um, like iron, copper, and zinc, mm -hmm. and maybe manganese, and maybe a few more, um, they need to be bound to proteins. They are not free. There's a debate in the, in, in the research community about zinc, if there are small pools of metals or not, mm -hmm. that might have a function. So for these bulk metals, we have them free in our bodies, and that's fine. So it's more for these particular metals. Then they have to be bound to proteins. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, thank you for a nice speech. Uh, you mentioned at last that teamwork is important in, in lab. Um, I think there's many conflicts going on in lab, so how would you overcome the conflicts between... Oh, conflicts in the lab between yes. the, my, the teammates? Yes. Oh, we don't have that. <laughs> <laughs> you ha no, I think that's... 
in general, I don't think there are com conflicts in the lab, actually. And I think it has to do with how you have a group. And I think in my group, at least, it's, it's teamwork. Everybody works on different projects, so they all know their own questions. But they all relate it so they can help each other. And I always trying to get them to, to, to work together. And some know th some things and some know other techniques. And then they can give to each other. So it's about how you lead them, I think, and talk to them and, you know, if everybody's successful, that's better for all. So you, but I think it's something you have to really kind of implement and, and work with. Okay, thank you. Sorry for if my voice was difficult to hear because I'm I caught a cold. Mm -hmm. And thank you for the great lecture. And I was interested about the structure of the protein at uh, about that what kind of elements that consist the protein or amino acids and why they why why the combination of elements that m makes uh, some change of states of uh, fold or other kind of movement and finally con constitutes a human body that's a big question. <laughs> that, so in principle, wh what elements that constitute a protein? It's a lot of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, right? And then there's a few other elements in proteins as well. But it's very simple building blocks of the amino acids that actually makes up really complex molecules. But when, they fo when they're folded or unfolded or folded, that's no change in the chemistry. It's the same chemical bonds, the same atoms in there. It's just the physical structure that changes. So it's these hydrogen bonds or conformational differences. So the atoms are the same in a folded and an unfolded protein. I think that's one part of your question. And but then what elements bo a body ma is made up to, I don't think I can go into the details there, but it's, it's, it's mostly organic material, right? With few milligrams of different metals. Uh, and that works. Somehow. We can talk more about that later. Thank you. The, f the final question, then uh, the p people can ask her at a coffee break. Okay. okay. Yeah. Thank you for your wonderful presentation. I'm really interested in protein folding. My question is where do metal ions bind to polypeptide chains, like at the end of the polypeptide chains or in the middle? Oh, that's a very good question. Uh, so metals bind, it, metals like particular amino acids. For example, copper likes to bind to sulfur. And cysteines are amino acids that have a sulfur in the end. So many times it's not in the end of the protein, but it's more in the folded state, you would have some residues next to each other that might stick out some sulfurs. And then you bind your metal to that. So Many metals like to, it's not just one coordination, it, it's several bonds that makes different geometries. But you like, so some of the amino acids are more prone to interact with the metal and some are not. And that means that I can look at the protein sequence and I could say, in some cases, that this must bind the copper because you see this pattern of amino acids here that constitute the binding site. So it, they don't bind random. They have specific places that they have affinity for, they want to be there, and other places they don't want to touch. But that's a good question, then how do they come to those spots and how do they find them? Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. It's coffee break and come back at 11 o'clock. You can now ask her questions. Yeah, ask me.